Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Prasant Mohapatra. I'm the Vice Chancellor for Research at PUC Davis. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome everyone to today's talk, which is a part of the Distinguished Speaker Series in Research and Innovation. This series brings accomplished thought leaders from around the world to UC Davis to share their vision for the next generation of research and how it can transform our society. This series has also been bolstered by a strong collaboration between UC Davis, Office of Research and the School of Medicine that in many ways flourished in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, bringing together research teams and experts from across the disciplines and schools at UC Davis to find innovative ways to unite our campus in the various research activities. This spirit of collaboration has yielded tremendous results with over $38 million in COVID-19 research funding and has fostered powerful partnership across discipline, bringing together scientists, clinicians, and engineers. We are pleased that you can join us today for an exciting program with renowned guest, Dr. Lawrence Corey. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce um, Alison Dresia, the Dean of uh, School of Medicine at UC Davis. Thank Alison. you so much, Vice Chancellor Mahapja, and welcome everyone. As the Vice Chancellor mentioned, there's been a tremendous collaboration and innovation at the School of Medicine with our partners across UT, UC Davis in the last year with high profile research on COVID vaccines, testing and treatment. UC Davis School of Medicine is part of the ongoing Pfizer trial, the Novax trial, and many others. As one of the nation's top schools of medicine for research and for training a diverse physicians in primary care and family medicine and offering our patients innovative treatment, we know that that improves community health and quality of life. That is one of the ways that academic medical centers like us can continue to advance health equity and increase access to life-saving care. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ralph Green, Distinguished Professor in the Department of Pathology and Medicine at UC Davis School of Medicine. Thank you, Dean Brashear and Vice Chancellor Mohapatra. It's my privilege to introduce our distinguished guest this morning. Dr. Larry Corey is an internationally renowned expert in virology, immunology, and vaccine development. He is the former president and director of the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center and professor of medicine and laboratory medicine at the University of Washington. His research focuses on herpes viruses, HIV, the novel coronavirus, and other viral infections. He is principal investigator of the HIV Vaccine Trials Network, HVTN, which conducts studies of HIV vaccines at more than 80 clinical trial sites in 16 countries on five continents. Under his leadership, the HVTN has become the model for global collaborative research. Dr. Corey is also the principal investigator of the Fred Hutch-based Operations Center of the COVID-19 Prevention Network, CoPN, and co-leads the network's COVID-19 vaccine testing pipeline. The, the CoPN is carried, carrying out the large Operation Warp Speed portfolio of COVID-19 vaccines and monoclonal antibodies intended to protect people from COVID-19. He has been instrumental in initiating and promoting several biotechnology spin-off companies, including Juno Therapeutics, Immunex, ICOS, and earning millions of dollars for the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. Dr. Corey is a member of the US National Academy of Medicine and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and is one of the most highly cited biomedical researchers in the past 20 years. On a personal note, I'd like to add that I have it on very good authority that Dr. Corey is also an outstanding clinician. According to my son, Damien, who's on the faculty at the Hutch, Dr. Corey's infectious disease consults are without peer. It's an honor to welcome our distinguished guest, Dr. Corey.
you were muted. Dr. Corey? Yes. You muted, Dr. Corey. Good. Well, I'm sorry. I um, apologize. Well, first, thank you for the very kind words, Dr. Green, and thank you for the invitation, Dr. Mahapatra and Dean Brashear. Um, <clears throat> it's a pleasure today to be able to, um, you know, talk about a success story, um, really maybe uh, the, um, an incredible success story of science and the story of how science builds on science. And I'm going to sort of go through the, 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 really the start from, I guess, 14 months ago, um, um, maybe actually preclinically um, within uh, hours of the, of, the, of the gene being um, put onto, uh, onto the website of, of the novel coronaviruses that the, the whole process of starting to develop um, COVID-19 vaccines um, started. I'm gonna concentrate on the clinical development but um, we'll hopefully tell some of the story of how all this started. Now, conceptually uh, on science being on science, um, we had known uh, from work that um, really a lot of it had emanated from the Vaccine Research Center, which was established 21 years ago to work on HIV vaccines. And so much of the sort of the basic biology behind um, um, the, the development of, of SARS-CoV-2 has been based on the science of, of, uh, of HIV and the structural biology. So it was known uh, from the other SARS-CoV-1 um, uh, uh, that neutralizing antibodies were like most viruses associated with the landing year of the virus. This is the, the, the picture that we all see on TV almost nightly, um, the red being the, the, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. And that's the landing gear. Um, and the basic concept in virology is if a virus can't land, it can't get into the cell. If it can't uh, get into the cell, it doesn't replicate. And in some respects, it's not alive. So knowing where it lands and how to block landing is essential for attacking the agent. And um, this sort of animation uh, over here is, uh, um, is the viral spike protein on, on, on the virus. Um, this actually is the uh, uh, human AC receptor, which is in our nose and our lungs and um, some of the heart tissues and some of the GI tract and some of the manifestations of the disease. It's really showing the uh, attachment between the spike protein and the ACE2 receptor. Um, <clears throat> we're seeing genetic mutations that are increasing the frequency of these att uh, attachments. We see this in some of the UK variants as well as some of the other um, newly emerging variants. And frankly, this schematic of just showing where an antibody blocks attachment and the elicitation of antibodies uh, um, is important in that we're not going to um, overlook T cells, but in this animation, uh, it really just is sort of conceptualization of how viruses um, and how vaccines work. Now, um, when we started working on this, um, which was really in March, uh, when um, Tony Fauci, who I've worked with for over 30 years, um, especially in HIV vaccine development, but early on in antiretroviral therapy together, um, called me to sort of say it's time to pivot and think about taking the, the, the infrastructure that we built in HIV vaccines and, and work on COVID vaccine development. The VRC had already started working on, on this, uh, um, knew that, um, uh, that spike protein was going to, you know, the most likely candidate. They had worked on um, the, the MERS coronavirus uh, as well as SARS-CoV-1. Um, they developed a, uh, a structure that was what we call in the prefusion state in the open state that we could stabilize that in an open position. And that was that antibodies directed to the prefusion protein, especially in the open uh, position and uh, could uh, elicit neutralization. Uh, and they were the best neutralizing antibodies. So when we thought about the clinical development, we knew we needed to develop multiple platforms. This is a slide that I met that was made a year ago. Um, we knew that no single vaccine platform could be manufactured in enough scale to immunize the entire adult population in the world. At that point in time, we didn't know much about children. It's very clear that children um, have significant morbidity, both uh, biological and sociological, from, from uh, SARS-CoV-2 and um, <clears throat> need also to be vaccinated. We needed to use all the known platforms to cover the field scientifically. Manufacturing scalability was a key factor. We needed to coordinate this. We actually needed to work with large pharma because they had the manufacturing ability. 
and we needed a coordinated effort between academia, industry, and government to do this. And um, so conceptually, you know, um, a program was outlined by the U.S. government uh, to essentially take the major plat platforms, protein-based vaccines, uh, that's traditional vaccines, uh, whether it's used now mostly by recombinant DNA technology, um, uh, Sanofi, GSK, and Novavax are, are uh, personified that. Um, essentially, genetic immunization, RNA and DNA technology, RNA was picked um, uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, and viral vector vaccines, both the AD26 vectors and the chimp AD um, uh, were picked as through the platform technologies to develop SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. And um, so the, the goal was to essentially have all of these work, hopefully, um, because we needed all of them from a, from a manufacturing technology point of view. And it's been very enlightening. Um, that the RNA technologies uh, were the fastest to develop, the fastest to, do, to uh, develop preclinically, um, and the first to go into humans. The RNA, um, just to review that, is you're essentially taking RNA, putting it in these um, uh, lipid nanoparticles like soap bubbles, inject it into muscle cells. The muscle cells read the RNA, confirmationally make the spike protein, that's presented to the immune system, and um, you get antigen processing, you get antibodies, you get T cell responses, you probably get both CD4 and, and a little bit of CD8 responses also. Um, it's a little bit different for the, um, the ad vectors. Um, this is the ad 26 vector. Yes, the gene is the same spike protein gene is um, uh, put into the, uh, the, the ad 26 vector. Um, that is uh, carried into the um, muscle cell. Uh, it actually goes to the nucleus, has to be transported out of the nucleus into antigen processing, um, and again, appearing uh, spike proteins on the muscle cells, and you get the uh, um, inducing an antibody of T cells. So when we looked at the fact we had these platforms, how would we test them? Um, uh, we sort of outlined this in an article with John Mascola, the head of the BSC, and Tony, as well as Francis Collins from um, uh, the, obviously the head of the NIH. I felt that we knew that they would be not uh, manufactured at the same time. So we looked at the conceptualization of individual clinical trials that were harmonized. We harmonized them um, by having common endpoints, common clinical trials network, um, common laboratories that would do the assessments. Um, when we're starting to look at correlates protection, we'll probably see the first part of that uh, from the Moderna vaccine. Uh, sort of the beginning of the three or four weeks ago, three or four weeks from now to see if there is a uh, correlate of protection. And importantly, we also had a common data safety monitoring board, an independent group of 11 people, statisticians and clinicians who have been sort of the unsung heroes of this whole effort. They actually are the people who meet essentially almost weekly. They coordinate all the, all the trials um, that are run by the U.S. government. And they um, review the data and sort of make the determination when the efficacy trials and the efficacy endpoints are, um, are, are reached and uh, whether data can be uh, made public and analyzed. We also then had to build an army and um, to actually do the clinical trials. Um, and we took the HIV infrastructure, the, HIV, uh, the network I work uh, um, I run the network that uh, my, Dr. Mike Cohn runs at the um, at UNC. That is the uh, HIV prevention trials network that does the work in prevention antiretrovirals, and the an infectious disease clinical research consortium that is the influenza um, virus uh, programs. And we put that together as for the COVID nineteen prevention network, and then also um, started. Um, including at Davis, and, um, to come and join us in this effort. And um, we were able to take um, um, a network that we had about 40 or 50 sites in the United States in May to build that up to over 160 clinical trial sites uh, throughout the country by uh, using our academic research organizations, our VA hospitals, our Indian health hospitals. And it was really one of the gratifying things of working this year has been to be able to see the country come together in such a, uh, uh, a way that the infectious disease community and the heart and lung community that were taking care of patients with COVID participated in these vaccine trials. 
And it was um, pretty unprecedented, the scale and scope. We started the Moderna and Pfizer trials. The Pfizer decided not to come with the U.S. government. They did it uh, themselves. But both of them started in July. Uh, the AstraZeneca started in August. Johnson & Johnson in September. Uh, Novavax um, uh, late just after Christmas. And Sanofi has been the, the, la the late one to, to say that the, the first set of uh, proteins that they made were not properly folded and not made in enough concentration. They had to go back and do that. Uh, they're finishing up their phase two trials now um, and uh, due to start their efficacy trial in mid-May, um, a product that I think will be important for the world, um, how, you know, uh, obviously we're going to get our country immunized with these other vaccines before they come um, into fruition. Now, um, how are we going to do this? Um, we, when we did the statistics of this, we sort of looked at this and said, well, we could do 12 to 15,000 person trials, um, but seed was important in wanting to compress this um, and get data on both safety and efficacy as quickly as we could. So uh, we essentially doubled the numbers so that each of the trials were 30,000 persons um, we needed 150 disease endpoints to show at least the 50% efficacy with a 30% what we call lower bound. Um, and, you know, fortunately, we will we're way above that. I think one of the most important issues for us and for uh, the community was it was critical to enroll Black, Latinx, and tribal communities into each trial. It's very clear that health disparities have been um, uncovered um, in all aspects of our life by COVID-19. But in the disease itself, um, the major risk factor throughout the country um, was race. Um, uh, and Blacks, Latinx, and uh, uh, tribal communities had three times the, the incidence of acquisition and uh, essentially three times the, uh, the overall death rate. And, it, and the disparities were especially uh, great um, uh, you know, between the 40 and 60 year old age range. Um, <clears throat> just because of lack of time and wanting to spend time on the, on the vaccine aspects of this, I'm not spending the time on, 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 on the epidemiology of, of it in our country. But, it was essential to evaluate the vaccines in the epidemiological setting of persons at greatest risk of its complications uh, and acquisition. And you know, we, uh, to me, uh, it's most likely the force of infection from um, uh, density and the inoculum load that really has been the issue that uh, why um, the Black, Latinx, and tribal communities have had higher incidence rates um, uh, during this um, epidemic. So I'm gonna briefly go through um, uh, the data, a lot of it is published, but just to highlight this. So um, just to say that the RNA vaccines have been, um, you know, um, spectacularly successful, both from the clinical trial point of view and the real world. This is the phase two data from, from uh, Pfizer. Um, I'm, I'm barring this just to say that at day 21, which is three weeks after the first um, 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 uh, immunization, the y-axis here is the pseudovirus neutralization assay, and to say that there's not much antibody. And that is correlated with much less effectiveness after the first dose than after the second dose. Um, for Pfizer, it's three weeks, and for Moderna, it's at four weeks. Um, really gives you super levels of neutralizing antibody. This is um, uh, the, the placebo group here. Um, and one thing we have in all the vaccines is that we've learned that vaccine-induced immunity is better than natural immunity. Uh, we get greater protection, greater antibody responses, and um, uh, I'm, I'm certain we're gonna see more, more durability with vaccine-induced immunity than with, um, quote, um, natural infection. And the concept that we must promulgate is more vaccine-induced immunity rather than herd, herd immunity. Um, um, slightly lower titers in the 65 to 85 year old age range, but still quite decent titers. Um, <clears throat> may all Kaplan-Meier curves of every study that we do in life look like this. Uh, this was the Kaplan-Meier curve for the Pfizer. This is symptomatic COVID. Um, over here, it is the vaccine group, and this is the placebo group with this enormous separation. And you can see it's like 92, 95% uh, effective, um, uh, well, well published. Uh, the Moderna vaccine. Now, both Moderna and Pfizer use the exact same strand of RNA. Their lipid uh, molecules and some of their dampening molecules are different, but essentially that the spike protein sequences that are making the prefusion protein that are presented to the body are exactly the same. 
And uh, the clinical results are amazingly um, uh, the same also. So <clears throat> this is uh, more of a forest plot rather than a Kaplan-Meier curve for the Moderna vaccine. And what you see is here, 94% efficacy overall, 95% um, uh, and less than 65, around 90% um, uh, at greater than 65. Um, you know, that, that's mainly due to numbers. These uh, really overlap. You can see in, um, whether uh, severe disease um, essentially over, um, uh, again, in the high 90s, male, female, so, um, at risk for uh, COVID morbidities and ethnicity were all the same uh, during these trials and we had good sample sizes. I have to say that if you asked me that I thought that these two vaccine trials would be so similar, I, 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 you know, I don't think you could have ever predicted that. But so one, the Pfizer trial was 43,000. The, um, uh, the Moderna trial was 32,000. To have two large-scale efficacy trials enrolled and completed independently with such similar results, I think is almost astonishing. Um, the spike part of the RNA transcript is essentially identical, allowing one to feel, I think, quite comfortable about the veracity of the efficacy data. And the safety data uh, showed that the vaccines are well tolerated. I think it's well known that the second dose gives you um, <clears throat> more local side effects and more systemic side effects. Um, uh, and that the younger you are, the more severe the side effects are. Um, <clears throat> and we treat the vaccines um, similarly and, and the data are showing that they um, are essentially the same. Uh, real world data is now available. Um, uh, Israel has been the population in the, in the country in the, in the world that has essentially immunized most of its population and some of the really great data is coming out of that because they have a healthcare system that is essentially computerized. And um, here is, um, uh, you know, about halfway through their vaccination program, I've sort of, sort of highlighted that they get about 43% efficacy after the first dose and 95% after the second dose, 49% um, <clears throat> uh, to 95%. I am an advocate of, of two doses. I don't like um, the idea of having one dose and spreading it around. Uh, more and more variants are coming out with uh, 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 immune variants that have selection biases um, <clears throat> that, um, that, that are evolving. There's one <clears throat> especially mutation, we call that E to K mutation and at the receptor binding site that, um, re that is neutralization resistant um, and can, so I, I feel as these emerging uh, variants are occurring uh, in our country, um, it's uh, having a lot of people with just one dose is gonna actually lead to, to uh, I think more induction of, uh, uh, of, uh, of immune resistant viruses. And <clears throat> it's really the two dose regimen that we should be promulgating and getting complete immunization to everybody as quickly as we can. These are data that you amazingly can now pull down from Google and um, looks at the daily cases of Israel before and after vaccination. And this is the mobility index that you pick up from telephones. Um, so um, this, is a, a, this is the effect that you see about with half the country vaccinated, whether we'll see that <clears throat> in our country, um, which has way, way more space and had way more cases. Um, <clears throat> I don't think you, you will see these kinds of effects quite as quickly. But what you're showing is that there's an increase in mobility and a real drop in both cases, um, as well as um, hospitalization and deaths. And uh, we're starting to see drops in hospitalizations and, and deaths in selected areas, uh, not very much in, a, in a, any drop of, of cases. And we'll come back to talk about that. One of the issues has been the durability. They were all licensed after two months of follow-up uh, under the emergency youth authorization. But again, some nice data coming out of the Pfizer six-month durability data. By this time, the trial had accrued 800, 927 cases. 850 were in the placebo and 77 in the vaccine. So lots of cases occurring, but still holding at a 92% efficacy. In the United States, um, we had acquired in the, in, in the study 697 cases, so very robust data. So breakthrough cases do occur. You need a numerator and a denominator. 93% um, is not 100%, but it is you know, terrifically great. But for severe disease in the Pfizer study, 
um, which when it was published had only nine cases. They now have 32 cases of severe disease by the CDC definition, 22 by the, by the FDA um, with essentially 95 to 100% um, um, reduction in severe disease, which I think is, is really <clears throat> the, the main issue here. Why um, we all wanna overcome vaccine hesitancy. The, the personal benefit for this vaccine is overwhelming. Um, uh, as it relates to the risk benefit ratio of symptomatic disease. What it does yet on transmissibility, we can come back with, we don't really know. Uh, can we still get colonization of your nose and transmission? And that's why we have masks. We don't really know that at the moment, that, that whether that occurs or not occurs. There's a study that we've just put in the field, swabbing someone, uh, swabbing people daily, um, uh, both uh, off of vaccine and during vaccination to see if we can reduce colonization uh, and the vaccines are highly effective that way. I'm optimistic that we'll show that, but at this point in time, we don't know that. The most interesting uh, new data out of, the, out of the Pfizer data where they had a small group of people that they sort of enrolled in South Africa, just that when they started to have the South African variant, the one we call B1.351, it's the most resistant variant, uh, neutralization resistant. It has multiple mutations in the receptor binding site and they had very high efficacy. Um, and so we're, we're looking and optimistic that our current Wuhan strain um, uh, uh, RNA vaccines may be very effective. Let me move a little bit to a vaccine that's certainly been in the news. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about more about that, which is the recombinant AD26 vaccine from Johnson & Johnson. Um, this has been a one-dose va uh, vaccine uh, in phase one, phase two trials. It's a platform that has been licensed for Ebola. Um, we've used it extensively in, um, uh, in HIV research, vaccine research, and it's also uh, in clinical under, uh, investigation for respiratory syncytial virus uh, for, at the moment in the elderly. It hasn't <clears throat> yet started its trials in the, in the pediatric population. Uh, in phase one, two studies, this vaccine gave much lower neutralizing antibody titers than RNA vaccine gave very good binding antibodies. The neutralizing titers started, started to appear at day 28 and sort of rose over day 72, but it had very nice CD8 T cell responses, better than RNA and very good CD4 T cell responses. Um, <clears throat> that went into a, uh, a trial that was um, international. And I, I have to say, uh, when we did this with J&J, &J, we asked them to go international to Brazil and South Africa because we were running so many trials in the United States, I was actually worried about the capacity of the, of the program to, to enroll the trials rapidly. We wanted each of the trials to be enrolled over an eight-week period of time and get an answer within um, four months of, of, of um, after the second uh, immunization and get an answer with, within six months. Uh, so we used our clinical trial sites internationally. Uh, we knew Brazil had a large outbreak. We knew South Africa was having an outbreak, but we really didn't know at that point in time that the virus was changing. And it was very prescient that we have these highly resistant viruses and we had a vaccine trial right in the areas where, where the, the virus was, was uh, changing. So the efficacy here, um, was not in the 90s, it was in the 70s. Um, the fact it was still in the 60s against the, in Brazil and South Africa, where we were seeing, seeing these resistant variants was, was really good news. What was more important or most impressive was that the prevention against severe disease was better than the point prevalence against um, mild to moderate symptomatic disease. So that was pretty close to 85 or 90%. And these are the Kaplan-Meier curves. Obviously, they're a little bit different than, than RNA, they're not, but the separation is pretty rapid, um, starting uh, at day 24, starting to really sort of separate even more at day 28. This is the virus vaccine. This is the placebo. This is the, the cumulative incidence of all cases. And this is the cumulative incidence of severe cases. Um, which really does level out and you really don't break through the, almost all the severe cases were prior to day 35. And so once you get past that, you really had um, a nice durability against uh, severe COVID-19. And in South Africa, the same pattern, this is where the variant, 96% uh, of the cases are the variant, really highly um, uh, resistant, takes 10 times more neutralizing antibody to neutralize the B1.351 variant. Um, so you 
start seeing the separation of curves, when you start seeing antibodies after day 28 and 35, and then you again sort of um, saw this rise in the placebo group and, and level off. But again, 85% um, severity, um, reduction in severity. Um, the AZ trial uh, has just been announced in the United States. Uh, CHIMPAD trial this is the, sort of the Kaplan-Meier curve in the United States. That's uh, a 73% uh, overall efficacy uh, of their primary endpoint. Um, uh, that is in the midst of being prepared for an emergency youth uh, uh, emergency youth use authorization. I'm not sure. Well, the, the role it has had in Europe, is, and we'll talk about that, is, is very large. The role it'll play in the United States um, when we have the RNAs as well as the J&J &J vaccine and um, maybe soon the Novavax vaccine is, remains to be seen. But it has made an impact in, uh, in the UK, um, albeit again, the same Google map. Uh, it is starting to have a reduction in the UK and having a reduction in hospitalization mortality. Um, but, it, you know, that's also, um, the UK is still closed down. Um, so the UK has taken the, the, the tactic of um, immunizing a lot of people with one dose before they come back to be fully vaccinated. We'll see if um, what that does with respect to the, the incidence of emerging uh, variants. But that country is still locked down and uh, just hard to know the real world effects. Of, uh, of this vaccination yet um, uh, uh, in Europe where it's been extensively used. Um, just sort of illustrating that both you can look at the data and, and, the, and the issue of interpreting that uh, as it relates to the mobility in the epidemiological setting. <clears throat> where the AZ vaccine has differed from the AD26 <clears throat> in its ability to work on the variant. Uh, this is a small study that was done in South Africa um, in which early on there was the European variants and then the South African variant, the B1351, emerged. And most of the cases in this study of generally healthy people with no comorbidities um, showed that really that the vaccine had no efficacy, a point prevalence of 10%, minus 78 to 54. It doesn't work against the variant. Um, and this is a problem because Chimpad is the cheapest and the easiest uh, was the, had sort of the best characteristics from distribution. But in the air, many areas of the world, especially essentially the African continent, <clears throat> uh, it is <clears throat> not gonna be a vaccine that is gonna be usable. Um, uh, we don't know if it protects against severe disease. I myself don't know a, um, a vaccine in biology that gives you a, essentially a, no efficacy against a symptomatic disease that would really work against severe disease. You know, maybe that's gonna be the case here, but um, uh, making public policy on no data when you have um, no efficacy as compared to where every, all the other vaccines is, is um, to me problematic, I would say. Uh, the last vaccine that I want to sort of review is the Novavax vaccine. That's a protein-based vaccine that um, makes the protein, that makes the trimer. Uh, it's in this sort of rosette kind of um, uh, structure. It's been tested and data are available for, um, from it from both uh, UK, the United Kingdom, where the B117, the UK variant, uh, was, was prevalent. Uh, there was about a 15,000-person study uh, in, uh, in adults. 27% um, over the age of 65. And you had very good efficacy um, in sort of the er early strains, we'll, we'll sort of call them, they're actually based on the Washington strain that were circulating in Europe in, in, in uh, early on. Uh, it had like 96% effectiveness, as good as the RNAs. Against the uh, UK variant, we lost about 10%, um, but it had a very good 100% um, protection against severity. So um, we expect um, the US trial here is um, fully enrolled. Um, there's a double blind crossover, I think it's to start tomorrow or, or maybe Monday, I think. Um, um, and so we'll fairly soon be finding out the results from our own study, but you know, we would expect that we will have um, this protein-based vaccine um, available to us fairly soon. In South Africa, it created, um, it, 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 they did a study again in healthy South Africans, a small study, only 4,400 people. Um, there was efficacy, but a significant hit. Um, overall, uh, the efficacy was 48%. Uh, um, 
in non-HIV infected people was 55%. And for reasons that we don't really know, um, it appeared no trend in uh, any efficacy in HIV infected people. And that's an issue that we, the world have to figure out. Um, uh, but this vaccine is affected by, um, uh, by the variants. The last thing I wanna uh, talk about um, uh, before we get to the question and answer are these two articles that uh, appeared uh, uh, last Friday in the New England Journal on thrombotic thritocytopenia uh, associated at this time with the AZ, but we now uh, in our news know that we've had a few cases uh, with the F26. Um, let's go over this and to, 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 to come back to this. Uh, it has been um, uh, very similar. It's a very unusual clinical side effect and presentation uh, in which you get thromb thrombosis um, associated with thrombocytopenia, uh, similar to heparin-induced thrombocytopenia or autoimmune um, uh, heparin-induced uh, 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 immune th thrombocytopenia. And now we call this vaccine-induced immune thrombotic uh, thrombocytopenia or VIT. Now, in classic heparin-induced um, uh, thrombocytopenia or autoimmune thrombocytopenia, uh, the anion creates a neoepitope on platelet factor four. Um, uh, you get an antibody to that. Uh, that binds through FCs to, um, uh, to platelets and causes more platelet aggregation and, and, and activation. Um, <clears throat> In classical HIT, um, the therapy is heparin avoidance um, with alternative non-heparin anticoagulation and the use of <clears throat> intravenous immunoglobulins um, and or plasmapheresis. Now in vaccine-induced thrombotic um, uh, uh, thrombocytopenia versus HIT, um, we are seeing this um, anywhere from sort of five to 14 days for the ad 26 up to 28 days usually invariably with the first dose in, the, in chimp ad ox. The platelet count is, um, uh, is low, usually 20,000, uh, less than 20,000 in the reported cases. Um, <clears throat> low fibrinogen is common. D-dimers are very elevated. Um, the thrombosis is usually um, in the cavernous venous sinus thrombosis or splenic vein thrombosis. Um, uh, that has been sort of the most common presentation that, is, that has occurred. And it's really that associated with thrombocytopenia that um, has been sort of pathognomonic of the disease. Um, the laboratory tests is they have very high levels of antiplatelet factor four. Um, and uh, one of the reasons for the pause with ad 26 is to make us all aware to not use, to not use heparin and to um, use alternative forms of coagulation. Um, the, uh, when you do the anti-PF4 heparin IgG ELISA as a confirmatory ELISA, the OD is typically very high. It's neutralized by uh, excess heparin um, and sort of the laboratory assays to both diagnose this and uh, recognize the treatment are now becoming known. Again, the sort of pathophysiology outlined here in which the neoantigen creates an, auto um, uh, an autoantibody binds to the heparin platelet, uh, activates the platelet, uh, creates even more PF4, more thrombosis and thrombocytopenia. Um, this is a slide actually from the uh, Global Advisory Committee from the uh, WHO about the AC. Um, uh, case that the AC appears to be closer to one in 250,000. We've had six cases associated with about six and a half million doses of the N26 with j and so it's about one in a million. Um, most of the cases have been in women. Um, we had one on a clinical trial in a male, um, but six, the, the six others since then have been in women. Um, <clears throat> this slide, I won't spend any time on it, but it's sort of a risk benefit ratio as to, you know, looking at this, it appears to be in younger women. Um, uh, and um, we have to sort of evaluate, this is from the UK WHO sort of showing that the morbidity and mortality for COVID uh, versus uh, any morbidity or mortality associated with um, the VIT syndrome. And um, they're, they're basically illustrating that they feel, feel that the risk benefit ratio for the UK for this ongoing epidemic is uh, vaccination is um, uh, incredibly um, higher benefit than, than the risk of this uh, rare complication. So I'm gonna end with this to say that 
um, what the scientific community has done in COVID-19 vaccine development is remarkable. Um, you know, we, uh, you know um, well, we all need to feel proud of that. The, RNA viral, the RNAs, the viral vectors, the protein vaccines are making their mark and are essentially are the technology that will bring, will bring us back to social normalcy. Um, to date, the data say higher antibodies are great, but I don't think they're the only factor operant in uh, vaccine protection. The yeah, 26 vaccine data suggests that T cell immune responses are importantly, especially for severe disease. I think the immune correlates will differ by platform, especially for severe disease. And I think that point I'm making is, is that we have variants. The issue is how are we gonna license these variants? How are we gonna decide that we need variants? How do we decide we need to get a variant boost versus a, a prime? Are we gonna to need to be vaccinated every year? Um, how, how, what's our long-term strategy? It's great to have these conversations because we have incredibly effective vaccines, but there's a lot of things that we don't know. Um, we have uh, the HIV positive persons, we have especially those with variants, we don't really have good answers at the moment. Uh, our transplant and immune compromised persons are um, major issues here. We in medicine actually have to recognize that persistent COVID is associated with the emergence of resistant variants. And if we, and those variants can be transmitted asymptomatically to to their community as well as the, their household contacts and who then go out into the community. In fact, the UK variant and the B1351 variants probably all stem from what we would look back and say less than optimal care of the immune compromise with respect to the epidemiological setting of making sure that we uh, monitor these, uh, these people who have persistent COVID um, to make sure we use great precautions and frankly, to immunize um, uh, their household contacts and to um, uh, handle them in a way that makes sure that they don't introduce these variants into the community. We actually don't know the best way to treat our transplanted immune compromised persons, um, whether vaccination, which is the preferred early approach, but um, a lot of them, the early work in solid organ transplants, very nothing has been done essentially in marrow transplants. Uh, do they get immune responses to the vaccine? Do we need to use cocktails and monoclonals as prevention um, rather than vaccines or a combination of both? Uh, there are still things for us in medicine to, to work about. I think the implication of the variants um, is important for us is that I think we, you know, the Novavax trial had a, had a situation which they, in South Africa, they looked at people who were seropositive and seronegative and the frequency of variant acquisition was the same. So prior immunity did not protect against the South African variant. So herd immunity has never been a good concept uh, in, in my in opinion for a variant changing um, RNA virus. It was invented for measles and, and mumps and viruses that do not uh, or undergo antigenic variation. We already know that you can immune escape. We already know you can be reinfected. What is relevant is not herd immunity, it's vaccine coverage or vaccine induced immunity, which we know is greater than immunity from natural infection. And that is the way we need to approach this from a population point of view. We need to get as many people vaccinated as possible. Um, <clears throat> what criteria should we use to decide if we need strain alteration? Should it be laboratory assays alone or clinical data? I actually think that we need clinical data um, we need to monitor um, uh, where we are now. Um, defining loss of efficacy is critical. Will it be due to waning immunity or variant acquisition or both? And what's the best long-term strategy for COVID-19 um, remains yet to be determined. So <clears throat> the last thing I say is yes, we have more vaccine than anybody else and we're gonna get vaccinated and we have enough RNA to cover us. We certainly have between RNA and J&J, &J, we're gonna be able to cover this, but we're not safe unless the globe is safe. Um, we travel, we know the importance of travel in disseminating the virus throughout the world. What happened in February of 2020, uh, where this virus got seeded throughout the entire world um, uh, from initially travel and community community transmission. So we as a scientific community must advocate to create the infrastructure to vaccinate everyone globally as quickly as we can. That's the only way we're gonna cut down on variants. That's the only way we're gonna to totally be protected. And so we're doing a, you know, we have much to do in our own country, but we actually have to recognize that there are no borders 
and that's well shown with this virus um, throughout the world. So I'm gonna end there to say that you don't give a talk like this without hundreds if not thousands of people, um, all my colleagues in infectious disease throughout the country, um, to my, uh, to Kathy Newsel, Mike Cohn, uh, the people who've worked with me, Jim Kublin, who is ex uh, executive director of our program, to our funders uh, at NIH, uh, to Barney Graham, who really designed the, the prefusion uh, structure that has been used in almost all the, all the vaccines, John Mascola, who uh, <clears throat> as the head of the uh, VRC and have worked with intensely throughout these last 13 months. Um, uh, obviously, to Tony Fauci and Francis Collins, um, who have been amazing leaders and uh, communicators, uh, and to Operation, well, I guess the COVID response operations team, um, Ansef Slawi and David Kessler now, who have, um, and Mary Maravich and all these other people who work with us in, in bringing this um, uh, really advanced to both our country and the world. So thank you. It's been a pleasure to be able to talk about this. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Corey, for this absolutely fascinating uh, view from the top, shall we say. Uh, certainly, it, it takes a village, it takes a team, but um, it also takes leadership of the quality that you have clearly provided. There have been a, a literally myriad of questions. Uh, uh, it's been difficult for me to uh, look at all of them while, while watching your talk, but, but I do pick up several themes uh, among the questions. And, and I'll kick off with one of them. Um, you, you mentioned that uh, uh, among the elderly, uh, there is not as much of a response to the vaccine. And, and, and one of the questions that's come up is, uh, does the response to the vaccine in any way indicate or predicate the level of protection that individuals um, have acquired? Or yeah. it's just a spurious association. Yeah, I, I, I think the the issue that if it's uh, you know if, if it's if it's painful or you're shaking chills, it must be doing good. There's very little correlation between um, antibody titer and and your your um, immune response. At least what we measure, you know, um, you know. So th there's there's really no there not been any correlation between the severity of your reactive your well, I'll call your reactogenicity to the vaccine and your subsequent immune response. Um, uh, obviously, the um, the elderly we think is uh, you know uh, we have problems with both innate immune responses as well as uh, as uh, uh, adaptive immune responses. And the greater than eighty five is you know we didn't these these phase one and phase two studies were were very normal and very large. But you know, when you started looking at the, the percent of people or the number of people over 85 or 85 to 90, you know, they weren't a large number. And we're seeing more, you know, in the real world, it looks like we're starting to see more breakthroughs out of the, you know, in assisted living situations where um, 80, you know, the, the 85, 90, 95 year olds uh, seemingly have somewhat less efficacy. Now that doesn't mean they're having a lot of severity. But um, the, I, I suspect real world effectiveness will be less in the in those in that population, and it's going to be an interesting issue if there's an outbreak. Um, should monoclonals be used, or uh, monoclonals be enhanced um, when when we do this, or do we have to give them a, an extra dose? I think these are kinds of nuances that we're going to have to learn to how to optimize. And uh, some of these studies in assisted living are are being looked at now. Uh, sort of true efficacy studies. But I, I think we have to be, you know, we have to look and say, did we get it all right in every population? And I, I think there are just a lot of populations yet that we haven't, you know, we just haven't been able to, to, to really evaluate in a... In a, in a, in a right. um, so another in a recurrent way. theme among the questions is um, those individuals who, um, well, I guess they fall into two categories. Those who refuse to get vaccinated, but then those who would wish to be vaccinated, but through having some kind of compromise of their immune system, either uh, innate uh, genetic or uh, iatrogenic with all the, uh, the treatments and drugs that we're using, the rituximab and, and, and other agents, uh, this does represent a, a uh, 
um, a number of individuals within populations who essentially, as you've put it so well, um, serve as incubators for mutant forms of the viruses. How to deal with that is the question. Is there yeah. any kind of an approach? Well, I think here's where the academic medical centers, we got to step up and um, we got to push the NCI, push, push heart and blood to, you know, get us to do some cohort studies to, you know, when we vaccinate these people, I think we actually should look at their immune responses at the moment, uh, look at their antibody responses. Most medical centers have someone doing spike antibodies or have some, you know, that can start looking at that, starting to develop some data as to what's the percent of take and what are the immune responses. So we can actually start looking at, you know, how do we handle this? If people don't get their own immune response, then, and we're in the midst of an outbreak, then I, I think we had to start thinking um, um, the Regeneron antibodies last three months. Um, uh, there are other antibodies that are coming out that last four months, then maybe we need to use monoclonal antibody prophylaxis uh, for some of these people who are really high risk. Um, and I, you know, because I, I do think antibody pro prevention, there are data to show that, that that is working in the nursing home, they're, they're both Regeneron and the Lilly uh, antibodies have done stuff in the nursing homes, which show, you know, about an 85% reduction in disease and, and a significant re reduction in mortality. And I. I generally think prevention is better. So I think you start with vaccination, you use monoclonals. We need to create the data. You know, we have a lot of people who are not omitted from the trials, the rheumatology issues, the people on um, uh, all the antibodies we see every time we watch the news. Um, we, we need to, we don't have information here. Do you see any risk at all to uh, vaccinating individuals who are immune compromised or who have an underlying autoimmune disease? I, I think the risk is hypothetical. Um, I think that um, uh, I think the benefit is still very large. Um, uh, and um, I don't think you can rely on herd immunity. Um, and um, uh, to protect the concept that, that we're going to get enough vaccinated to protect the individual who's susceptible, I think is just the wrong concept. I think this virus is, way, is 10 times more infectious than influenza. One infectious particle versus 10 into a hamster model. I personally think this virus is more akin to measles than it is to um, even, even flu. And I, I, I therefore view that the direct benefit of the vaccination is very large. And so we're really uh, up against a race against time uh, in relation to the uh, uh, the emanation of, of, of mutant forms of the virus that will escape the efficacy of the vaccine. And so what do you foresee as either modifying the vaccine or increasing the frequency of immunization? Is that down the road? Um, uh, I think Ralph, you're spot on. I, I think one or the other is going to happen. Um, I think this, the some of the mutants, like the California mutant and maybe even the UK B117 mutant, I think the current strains of vaccines are going to hold just fine. Um, uh, the B351 mutants, um, uh, there's another sort of New York mutant that that is rapidly growing that again has uh, higher attachment value and also has the E to K mutation. Um, you know how and whether we'll get variants on that from the South African mutant, they, they are more concerned. Now the variant vaccines and RNA are starting to be made and there's entering, they've just started entering clinical trials. Um, will they give better coverage? I mean, I think the, my world at the moment is a lot of thought into variant vaccines and their immune responses and testing what's the best strategy. You know, I, I think we'll, come out of that with some science and I hope some clinical science also to tell us what's gonna happen next. The virus is not gonna go away. It's gonna be with us. Um, whether it will evolve in many years to be like other human coronaviruses or whether it, and they started out hundreds of years ago. I mean, I, this is a formidable pathogen. I mean, it's unusual. It causes the endotheliitis and all the other kinds of you know um, immune cascades that, that it, uh, make it a non-simple disease, in my opinion, a formidable uh, pathogen. So I don't know if we can predict the future here. Um, I think um, 
We just have to measure it and come up with strategies. I do think we have technologies to keep ahead of it, but I don't think we could predict the future of what this virus will do. And a priori, is there any reason to uh, suspect that that RNA-based vac vaccines uh, would differ in their efficacy against mutant strains compared with uh, the more traditional uh, antigen-based approaches? I don't think that a priori we would expect it to differ. I, I mean, I think um, you know the cellular machine, machinery and putting it out in the right confirmation. You know, maybe if we don't put this put it in right, it's possible that it won't come out in the right confirmation. I, I, I think we'll pick that up from the from the from the studies. But I think a priori, I think um, one of the neat things about this is that we can use RNA, the cell machinery and RNA vaccination to not spend a lot of time figuring out how to make something confirmationally work. Uh, it's sort of miraculous. And I think as we, we will see this technology be used in a, in a lot of ways um, as, a, as a manifestation and a, and a wonderful outgrowth of the COVID-19 uh, epidemic. Not that anything is so wonderful about the epidemic. <laughs> Well, that's a wonderful note to end on. And um, thank you so much for, um, for taking us through this in, in, in uh, warp speed and, and telling us in which directions this, this is going. Um, I'm going to hand back over to, uh, to, um, to um, um, Prasant Mohapatra. Uh, Larry, again, thank you so much. Well, it's been a pleasure and an honor to be here. Thank you again, Dr. Corey, um, for being with us today and sharing your remarkable expertise with us. Uh, and thank you, Dean Brashier and Dr. Green, and to all our audience for joining us today. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks again.